You're listening to the weekly sermon at Second Baptist Church in Cedartown, Georgia. Second Baptist Cedartown exists to worship God, disciple believers, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. God is so good, and He is greatly to be praised this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 23. Acts chapter number 23 is where we're going to be at, and we are uh, going to be, in the next couple of weeks, closing out our study of the book of Acts and uh, looking at what's taken place in the latter part of this particular book. Uh, Acts chapter 23, starting in verse 1, um, is where we're going to be at this morning. The, the Word of God can do many things in our lives, and uh, I'm thankful that we have this word to lead us and guide us every day. Uh, At times, the word of God cuts us deeply and convicts us when we are confronted with the truthfulness of God's word. It can challenge us and show us where we need to repent even and change. Uh, Other times, the Word of God gives us strength and it encourages us like nothing else can. Uh, There are times that I can look back on and I can think the only way that I made it through was trusting in God's Word and trusting in His faithfulness and in His truthfulness. And there are times when God's Word encourages us and we come away from an encounter with the truths of God's Word And we are radically changed for the better. And so today, I hope to be an encouragement to you. And I hope that uh, today that this will be a very encouraging word in your walk with the Lord here as we look at Acts chapter 23. We should seek to encourage one another in our walk with the Lord. Uh, There's so much difficulty in this world. This church and, and the church should be a place where we lift one another up, where we equip one another to go out into the world for the glory of God. Uh, Everybody else on the outside, the world is mean enough on the outside. We ought to have a church and be a church that loves one another and equips one another. Thank God for the family of God, the church of God, that we can encourage one another in the truthfulness of God's word. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Amen. So if you found your place, let's all stand in reference to reading God's word, Acts 23, and we're going to start with the first verse. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall." For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by him said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. 
Lord, thank you for its truthfulness, its relevance. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you guide us and you lead us every day by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you would uh, encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would allow us to grow in our faith and in our walk with you so that you may be glorified. We pray that you would take this moment, take this time. And we pray that your name will be glorified and you will be worshipped. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. We've seen in many places in the book of Acts the hand of God at work in the early church and the lives of early Christians in this first generation of Christians. And we've seen from one moment to the next the Holy Spirit at work. It's entitled the Acts of the Apostles, but as we've said many times, it could be entitled Acts of the Holy Spirit because that's really what we're looking at, what we're talking about. At every single given turn, the Holy Spirit is active and alive and is guiding his people. Here, Paul is facing some of the most significant trials in his life that he could ever be confronted with. Much of the latter part of the book of Acts, really, from uh, the first few chapters before chapter 23 and all the way to the end of the book is talking about Paul's trials and tribulations and confrontations and his time in jail and his time being persecuted and his time uh, being on trial and his time going from one place to the next, dragged from one court to the next, all because of his faithfulness in preaching the gospel. And so much of this latter part of the book of Acts is on those trials and tribulations. And then right smack dab in the middle of it, we see this encounter that Paul has with the Lord. And we see the Lord tell him so clearly in the midst of his trials, in the midst of his adversity, be of good cheer, Paul. I want to talk about the greatness of God's plan. And how it is so much greater than your plan or my plan. Aren't you thankful that God's plan is so much better than your plan or my plan? It is better than anything we could ever imagine. It's better than anything we could ever uh, come up with and try to, uh, try to decipher for ourselves. The plan of God is the greatest plan that you and I could ever possibly imagine. Even in the midst of... Trials and difficulties and difficult circumstances and situations, we may feel like uh, things are spinning out of control, but the truth of the matter is God has a plan that is greater than our circumstances. Mm -hmm. And what he's telling Paul here is that all of this that he's experienced and all of this that he's going through, he can trust in the Lord because he's got it all together and he knows exactly what is to happen and what is to come, and God's plan is greater, and he can be of good cheer in that. Well, we see some of these tribulations. We see some of these persecutions that are taking place. We talked about the other week how, how Paul was warned not to go to Jerusalem because the situation in Jerusalem was dire, and it was difficult, and there was going to be so many other things that happened in Jerusalem where Paul would be persecuted, and, and the truth of the matter is it was a difficult circumstance and situation but Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem because he felt led to go there no matter what he said he would be willing to lay down his life in Jerusalem well he does get arrested and he has to go on trial and this is what we're talking about here where the Sanhedrin are discussing Paul's case here at different points Paul had advocated and utilized his Roman citizenship to defend himself but then uh, a couple of different points. He also just gave his testimony, and you can see that here in the latter part of Acts, just telling them what's took, taken place, what's happened in his walk and relationship with the Lord. Here, he is in front of the high priest Ananias, and there's an interesting dialogue and exchange that happens between Paul and the high priest. Paul is slapped, he's persecuted, he's striked on the mouth, and he uh, echoes back at them, fussing back at them. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. He's simply saying that they're hypocrites in what they are doing and how they are uh, exchanging this particular issue with him. Uh, and then they ask, don't you know that this man is the high priest? There, there's a couple of different uh, ideas of 
why Paul said what he did in response to that. Uh, it could be that Paul actually didn't know who the high priest was. And, and the high priest here uh, was Ananias. Uh, and it could be that, that he had simply changed and, 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 and they had changed uh, who the high priest was and Paul didn't recognize him. What a lot of people think is, is more probable is that Paul was being sarcastic. And I think, I like to think that Paul was being sarcastic in this moment uh, because I think it, it, it seems to connect well to what's taking place in the middle of this trial. He says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. In other words, he's saying, I couldn't recognize him as the high priest, as someone with authority, as someone with power. What we can clearly see, though, in the midst of all of these issues is that God has a plan. Matter of fact, God has had a plan from the beginning. That's what the Bible tells us. John chapter 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God's message, the gospel, the plan of salvation has been the plan from the very beginning. God is not grasping for straws. God is not looking for plan B or plan C or plan D. God is not wondering what direction to go in. God is not confused. God is not worried about the circumstances. God always has had a plan and God will always have a plan. Throughout all of human history and throughout our mere existence here in this world today, God has a plan. So my main point is whatever plan man has cannot compare to the plan of God. I want to look simply at verse 11. And we're going to spend some time here just looking closely at what the Lord says to Paul in this moment in the midst of his difficulty. And I want us to look and to think about all the implications of this verse in Paul's life and in his walk with the Lord and how that impacts us when we are wondering about the circumstances of this life. We're wondering why we go through the things that we do. Maybe we're not brought before the Sanhedrin on trial and maybe we're not uh, slapped by those that are bringing us before the judge. Maybe we're not being thrown into prison or any of those other things. But the truth is sometimes there is difficulty and sometimes we have questions why we face the things that we do. And if we are doing those things for the Lord, we can be encouraged with our walk with the Lord because God knows and God has a plan. So first thing I want to look at is to be encouraged. The Lord looks at Paul. He says to be of good cheer. And we wonder, how in the world can you be of good cheer? How can you be encouraged, as some other translations would put it, in the midst of all of these trials, in the midst of these difficulties. Literally, this is going to be the most difficult period in Paul's life that will ultimately lead to his imprisonment, ultimately lead to his persecution, and by church tradition, ultimately lead to his martyrdom. <laughs> Paul is going to die for the gospel. And this, in essence, is where it all starts. And yet, the Lord looks at him and says... Be of good cheer. Be encouraged. It's the Greek word, tharseo. It means this, to be encouraged, to have courage, to be courageous. Another translation would put it this way, to be overly bold. It's not conveying a sense of pride or arrogance. It's not being overly bold and ambitious and in your own strength and, and being courageous in your own strength. It's having a realistic picture of the circumstances in front of you, but trusting in the Lord who is able to give strength beyond all comprehension for those insurmountable circumstances. This courage, this strength does not come from you and does not come from me. This strength and courage comes from the Lord. I like what uh, the, the world-renowned theologian John Wayne said about courage. That's a joke, by the way. But he does have good theology. John Wayne said, courage is being scared to death but saddling up anyways. Man, what a word. We need some John Waynes in 2023, don't we? Amen. There were great odds against Paul. The political elite were against Paul. The Sadducees, 
Now, they weren't religious, overly religious in the sense that like the Pharisees were. They were concerned with power. They were concerned with the dynamics between uh, Jerusalem and Rome. They were concerned with staying in power in so many ways. But the Sadducees, the political elite of the day, were firmly against Paul. They saw him as a threat. Then there were the religious elite, the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed in the final resurrection of the dead. They believed in angels. They believed in so much of these other things that Paul was proclaiming. And so we see in chapter 23 where Paul kind of utilizes the tension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Utilizes the tension to associate himself as a former Pharisee. He's the son of a Pharisee. And he's simply saying the truth has been revealed to him in this way. And he appeals to the Pharisees in that sense. But, but nonetheless, they were a part of this process as well, persecuting Paul. And then in chapter 23, after verse 11, if you read on, there is great persecution. There is great pressure. There is great stress that Paul is put under because this is what happens. More, more than 40 Jews in Jerusalem vow together that they would starve themselves until Paul is dead. They would say, we're not going to eat anymore until this man is dealt with. Could you imagine the pressure that Paul is experiencing in the midst of this? Until Paul would be killed, these men are going to starve themselves. These are odds that would be incomprehensible to most people. Many of us have moments in life and we look back and we think on those things and we, we simply come back with this conclusion. We say, I wouldn't have made it had it not been for the Lord. I think Paul would say the same thing. He wouldn't be there if it had not been for the Lord. There's no way that Paul could ever make it to Rome had it not been for the Lord. In those given circumstances, we have to rely on a type of courage that is supernatural, a type of courage that is beyond this world, a type of courage that is beyond our comprehension, our strength, our abilities. We have to rely on the courage of the Lord. I love that song that kids sing so often. I sing as a kid, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Y'all know it? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Adults, we need to rely on that more often, don't we? Be of good cheer. Be encouraged. Because this type of courage to face these circumstances of life, it can only come from God. It's a type of courage that supersedes any circumstance, any pressure, any adversity, any trial, any persecution. And the Lord looks at Paul and he says, be of good cheer. That can happen when you trust in God. When I was in New Orleans the other day for graduation, the president of our seminary, Dr. Jamie Dew, uh, gave a sermon during graduation that was a sobering reminder. And it's on the Facebook page for New Orleans Seminary if you want to go back and watch it. It was a sobering reminder of the calling of each Christian and the calling of ministers of the gospel and, uh, and he says something that really stuck with me. There were all sorts of people there that were graduating. Some were pastors. Some were uh, women ministry leaders. Uh, some were lay leaders. Some were uh, those that were on staff. And others, there were IMB missionaries that were being sent out and, and earning their degrees and everything else. And, and one of the things that he said was this. He said, you may be sent out of here and the cost will be significant in this day. It was a commissioning of sorts, but it was a sobering reminder about the world that we live in. Listen, if you're going to be faithful to the cause of Christ today, it's going to cost you something. Think about that. If you're going to be faithful to the cause of Christ and not only uh, know the gospel with your mind, but to live out the gospel with your life, it's going to cost you something. Dr. Dew went on to say, and talking about the situations we find ourselves in today with so much confusion and so many of the issues that we face, he said it's becoming more difficult for institutions like New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary to exist, not to thrive, to exist. It's becoming more difficult because of federal regulations with student housing and so many other issues and the, the day and age in which we live where nobody knows how to define gender or all of these other issues and 
Here we are as the church with this clear mandate to preach what God has said. And there is no confusion in what God has said. There is clarity. And this is, this is what he charged us with the other day. He said, you may go out of here and it may cost you a great deal to stand for the cause of Christ. And this is what he said, there is gain in the loss and there is life in death. How encouraging is that? But I think this is exactly what the Lord is saying to Paul when he says, be of good cheer. The modern church today must be courageous in living out our faith for the Lord. Secondly, God sees our work. God sees our work. He says, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, in verse 11, the Lord had seen what Paul did in Jerusalem. And the Lord had seen everything that he had went through, everything that he was currently at this moment going through. And he says, you have testified for me. Now remember what we started off with Acts 1.8 talking about, the great commission that Jesus gives to his disciples. Do you remember? He says, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the end of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. And here the Lord looks at Paul and he says, You have testified for me. You have witnessed for me in Jerusalem. What greater thing could be said of someone who was faithful to the Lord? One day we will have a final legacy that will be said about all of us and what greater thing could ever be said than he or she was faithful to the Lord, was a faithful witness of God. I want you to know this, God sees our work. You may wonder why the Lord is asking you to go somewhere or do something. There may be even circumstances in life that seem absolutely useless to us at the time. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you feel like you're spinning your wheels you don't know why you're doing the things that you're doing. You don't feel purpose in the things that you're doing. Can I remind you, God has a plan. God has a plan in every one of those circumstances. And you may be in a circumstance where nobody else sees what you do, but God takes note of every action. Amen. Think about things that are useless in our day and age, the things that we may look at as, as useless and we may wonder, Lord, am I just spinning my wheels doing these things? And, and I can always find an example of someone who is doing something even more useless when you think about the circumstances of our life. I don't know if you read an article about this. There was an artist, quote unquote artist, who, whose artwork was a banana duct taped to a wall. Have y'all seen this? Man, that's about as Useless as a football bat. Art, labeled as, labeled as art, a banana duct taped to a wall. What's even crazier than the artist who said this was art was the guy who bought it for $120,000. A banana duct taped to a wall. And then the other week you may have seen this. A guy from Georgia, of all places, ate the banana. Have y'all seen this? Literally in the news, a guy from Georgia ate the banana, and this is, this is what he said. Uh, the, the police came and interrogated him and all of this sort of stuff. Of course, he's got to be from Georgia. Uh, th this was his response. It wasn't vandalism. It was an art performance from me, and absolutely, I'm not sorry. And they, they said, why did you eat the banana? He said, I was hungry. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Listen, we, we, you may look at a circumstance and you may think, God, this is useless. I don't know why I'm doing this. Just remind yourself there's someone somewhere who made art with a banana and it was eaten. And somebody bought it for $120,000. So there's something more useless than anything that we're experiencing in this world. Listen, you, you may think, though, when you look at your work, work, you may think nobody recognizes, nobody sees, nobody takes note of what's what I do. Mothers, I know, feel this way from time to time. But can I remind you of this? God takes note of every single action. Amen. God sees it all. You may think the world doesn't notice the things you do. 
And it may be true from time to time, but there is a God in heaven who sees every bit of it, the good and the bad, for his glory, or if we are working in our own glory, God sees our work. And if we remain faithful, no matter what that work is, we're told to do all of it for the glory of God. If we remain faithful, God is glorified and he takes note in heaven. And praise God for that. That's all that truly matters. God had seen what Paul had done in Jerusalem. Lastly, he says this, so you must also bear witness. You must also bear witness at Rome. I want to talk about Rome for a moment where God was sending Paul. And I want to think about this, that God uses our circumstances. God was using these circumstances in the midst of what Paul was experiencing. And you can see God's plan just in this one verse, can't you? Be of good cheer, be encouraged, don't worry, Paul. Be strong, be courageous, be bold. I have seen what you have done, and I have a plan for you still of what is to come in Rome. Paul is to go to Rome. So much of the latter part of his ministry and the latter part of the book of Acts is focused on this transition, this arduous journey to the city of Rome in order to spread the gospel. So much of what we read about him in the book of Romans as he's writing to the church, to the Christians in Rome, he longs to be with them. He is encouraging them. It is his, uh, it is his greatest letter, I think you could say, in the New Testament when he's writing to the church in Rome. It's full, chock full of rich theology. And we see what some would call the gospel of Paul as he writes to the church in Rome, explaining in vivid terms and wonderful terminology the glories of Christ and his salvation that he offers. So much of Paul's ministry is linked to Rome. In Acts 19.21, we read these words. When these things were accomplished, talking about the ride at Ephesus that takes place, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So much of Paul's ministry was going towards that particular city. Paul experienced a great deal of adversity along the way, being imprisoned, being thrown on a ship to sail to Rome, being shipwrecked, being snake bit, being persecuted, being beat, being thrown on house arrest, being brought on trial, all of these things. And, and notice this. We don't know this according to Scripture, but church tradition, early church tradition, says that Paul was martyred in Rome. That he gave his life for the gospel in Rome. Now, we may look at many of those circumstances and we may think, that's not what I want to go through. That's not what I want to experience. I don't, I don't want to face all of those trials. I don't want to face all of that imprisonment, being snake bit and being shipwrecked and being thrown from here to there and ultimately to get to Rome. And, and we may sit back and think, well, God, if you had just made it a little smoother for him, Paul could have done more for your kingdom. As if we know what's best. God, if you'd have just gave him more resources and made it a little easier for him, th then he could have done more for your glory if, if you'd have done that. God, if you'd have given him more time, given him more time in Rome to go and to be there and to share the gospel with the people that are there. Lord, I know that you could have used those circumstances. Sure, God could have used those circumstances. But this, this was the plan of God for Paul. And you and I may not understand it. You and I may not completely fathom the persecution, the trials, the adversity, and everything else that came his way. But God knew exactly what he was doing from the very beginning. And God used Paul for his glories in ways that you and I could never imagine. And you and I probably would never imagine until we reach heaven one day. And we see the full picture. And we understand more of what God is doing and how he is using us for his glory. And you may look at your own circumstances and you may look at your own life and you may sit there and think, God, if you just give me this, Lord, if you just give me more time, if you just give, give me the answer to this circumstance, Lord, if I don't face this difficulty, I can do so much more for you. Listen, we never know how God is going to use our trials for his glory. 
God uses those circumstances in ways that are beyond our imagination. We've got to remind ourselves his ways are higher than our ways. His understanding is greater than our understanding. When I was uh, at the seminary, there's a piano on campus there at the seminary. I don't know if we have a picture. We may or may not, but... Uh, this is a piano of uh, the man who wrote the melody to the song, uh, Jesus Loves Me. And he wrote the melody to the song on this piano, Just As I Am. Think about the millions of people who have come to the faith because they responded to the gospel while they were singing the song, Just As I Am. One of the most famous invitational songs I think any of us could ever imagine. This piano was from the late 1800s, and um, William Bradbury wrote the melody to that song on this piano. Could you imagine the melody being played at that moment for the very first time in human history on that piano? I just get chill bumps when I think about it. He didn't write the words, though. The words to the song, Just As I Am, were written by a lady named Charlotte Elliott. And she was born in 1789, so 60 or 70 years before the man who wrote the melody to Just As I Am. And her life is an interesting one because she died fairly early and she experienced serious illness that left her as an invalid for much of her life even at a very young age. And because of this illness, she went through a crisis of faith, and she talked to an evangelist about it, an evangelist she trusted, and didn't know how she could come to Christ and what she had to offer Christ because of her invalid state. And this is what the evangelist responded and said to her. Come to him just as you from that, she wrote the words to the song, Just As I Am. We may think that we have to be prepared before we come to the Lord, or we may think that we have to get our affairs in order, or we may think we have to get everything straightened out before we could ever be used of God through our circumstances for his glory, we may think, Lord, I don't even know what I have to offer if I were to be used by you. But what God is asking of us is the same thing he asked of Paul. Just come. Just come and follow me. What God is asking for us is the same thing he's asked for every Christian. Pick up your cross. Die to self and follow me. Come just as you are. And the familiar refrain you know the song well goes like this just as i am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me second verse with me. Just as I am though tossed about with many a conflict many a doubt fighting and fears within Without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. God, we come to you today. 
and we just offer ourselves to you. Lord, I don't know what everybody is experiencing and what everybody is going through and what trials or adversities they may be facing. Lord, I don't know what this day means to every person in this room, but Lord, I know that you're good. I know that you're faithful. I know that you're trustworthy. And God, I pray that wherever one may be today, I pray that they would be of good cheer, they would be encouraged in their walk with you, to trust in you more, to lean on you more. God. Lord, I pray that you'd receive the glory with our lives. Help us, God, to understand there is a greater plan. It's not my plan. It's not anybody else's plan. It's yours. We can't see the full picture. But God, you know every intricate detail. You know each twist and turn and valley and mountaintop. God, help us to trust. Help us to come to you as we are. Lord, not with any preconceived notions, not with any sense of pride in what we have to offer, but with humility, with conviction, with boldness to approach your throne of grace. God, if there's someone who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today they would do that. I pray they would trust in you, that they would recognize their need of you, repent of their sins, and ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. To acknowledge him and confess that Jesus died for their sins and rose again from the grave and he's coming back one day. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to trust in you. Help us to continue to share the love of the gospel with others. Whether you send us to Cedartown or Jerusalem or Rome or the other part of the world. Lord, help us to just simply be faithful. And would you receive the glory with our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.